We have a, a very long text in front of us, and we're just going to take the first part and the last part. We're going to talk about that today, and then we'll move into the middle part in the, in the upcoming weeks. So we're going to read Acts 6, 8 through 7, 2, and then Acts 7, 54 through 60. So Acts 6, verse 8 is where we're going to start. If you'd follow along, that would be great. It says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And then we have several verses all the way to the end of chapter 7 of his sermon. And I want to pick it up in verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelled, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So I actually read a couple of verses into chapter 8 there. I want to do some context. Let's go to our notes. Let's figure out who some of these people are. And let's start with the synagogue of the freedmen. Well, you need to know who, what a synagogue is. You need to know who the freedmen are to understand who these people are. And then to understand the significance of why it's included here. So a synagogue was the prearranged gathering place of Jews for religious training, prayer, and fellowship. Now, synagogues normally existed in cities outside of Jerusalem. There was a synagogue at Bethlehem, a synagogue at, at every Jewish town outside of Jerusalem. Rarely did they exist in Jerusalem because in Jerusalem you went to the temple. So the fact that this synagogue existed in Jerusalem was a little bit odd, but there's a reason for it, a legitimate reason. But a synagogue is where you said, hey, we're going to gather together on this day at this time we're going to read scriptures, we're going to teach each other, we're going to do our thing, even though we can't go to the temple. So this was a common practice at this time. Every city that had a certain number of Jews, if I remember correctly, they had to have 10 males or something like that, maybe it was five, they had to have a certain number of male Jews, then they could have a synagogue. It was kind of like their local church, and it was a place for them to gather. So that's a synagogue. Now the freedmen, be in your notes, were Jews who were themselves former slaves. Now you get the freedmen name. Or they have come from families of former slaves. Now there's a lot of ideas about who the freedmen are. The biggest clue in scripture that, that draws us to this conclusion is it says, as it was called. 
In other words, this is a special group. They had a special name. They were called the freedmen for a reason. And so these would have been people that were, would have been taken back to, Rome, back to Rome by the Romans, would have been enslaved, and then for some reason they would have been freed. So we have to let go of the picture we have of slavery from the American history, and we need to embrace the picture of slavery we find in Scripture. Uh, sometimes you volunteered to be a slave. That was a way to pay a debt or, or get your feet underneath you. You could volunteer to be a slave while you accumulated wealth working as a slave. They would let you keep the extra that you were able to accomplish. In, in whatever way they got there, some by force, some by choice, they went to Rome, they were, they were slaves. Then when they were freed, they came back to Jerusalem. And so these people had a unique bond together they were, had been former slaves in Rome, and it says they were from Cyrene and Alexandria and Sicilia and Asia. And this is not Asia, the continent. This is an area uh, called Asia. You find it on a first century map. And they were all, they were all uh, cities along the water, along the ocean there. And that's mainly where the slaves would have come from. They'd get on a ship, go to Rome. And so their bond was that they were former slaves, so the synagogue of the freedmen was a group of Jewish worshipers whose bond was being freed from past slavery. Or they were the children of people that had been freed from past slavery. They would have continued in the synagogue because their parents were part of the synagogue. Now D is probably the only reason why this is even mentioned. So D, it's mentioned only so that we know where Saul came from. And Saul, you might recognize, is actually Paul. The Apostle Paul. So that's what goes in that blank there. It helps us know who Paul is to know where Paul came from. Because if you remember, Paul is a Roman citizen. How does a Jewish boy, a full-blooded Jewish boy, who is a Pharisee, have Roman citizenship? Well, at some point in his past, probably his parents, and we don't have any of this information. We have to put it together. Probably his parents, maybe his grandparents, had, had gone to Rome, either by force or by choice, had, had served as slaves in a, in a Roman family, and then either because they had accumulated enough money to purchase a citizenship, which was not uncommon at all, or because they served so well that they were given as a reward a citizenship when they left, they came back. So his parents came back to Jerusalem as Roman citizens. Paul, we know by other texts, is a Roman, Roman citizen by birth, which meant that his parents had to be Roman citizens. So his parents were the freedmen. They either had been slaves and, and come back, or they were the children of slaves who had purchased or been granted citizenship. Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. So now we know that since Paul has that slavery history, family history, some of these other scriptures, and I just, I just put three in your notes, help us understand where Paul's coming from. Paul in Romans, just one chapter in Romans, he said, we are no longer slaves to sin. He says, we can be slaves to sin or slaves to obedience, and we are set free from sin to become slaves to righteousness. So a lot of the time, Paul talks about slavery as a very good thing, a very positive thing. And in that culture, there was a good side to being a slave. If you didn't have any prospects in front of you, you could go basically volunteer to be someone's slave. They would pay you while you were the slave. They would allow you opportunities to earn money on the side. And then they would feed you and board you and take care of you. And at the end of your term, you could actually leave with money. Sometimes you could even leave with a little piece of the land that you would now elevate yourself above a slave, but you would still work for the person. So Paul has that in mind, and when he says, uh, don't, you don't have to be a slave to sin, you can be a slave to obedience, he, he sees a positive side. So he talks about being a slave a lot, being a slave to Christ, being a slave to righteousness, a slave to obedience, and we can kind of get a flavor of who he is, and if we can remember that as we continue through uh, Acts and, and some of his letters, that will help us gain some understanding. So I think the reason that bit of context is here is so that we can know who Paul is 
when we're introduced to him. So the synagogue of the freedmen are the ones who are leading the charge against Stephen. They're probably the ones who stoned him. And as a member of their group, Paul held the coats. And as he held the coats or guarded the, the coats, that kind of places him in a leadership role. So we see Paul being a leader of this group. That's a little bit of context. Why, why are they uh, excited here? Uh, they, they probably are a group that said, you know what, if the rest of the Jews can't do anything about these people, we will. And they went and challenged Stephen, who was nearby, perhaps. They went and found him. He was teaching. They challenged him. And it says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him. So they, they stood up and challenged him. Probably Saul was part of the challenge. They couldn't stand up. They couldn't, they couldn't match wits with Stephen. And that's, that's really all the context we need to understand the, the, the scriptures we're looking at. So let's go to lessons from the short spiritual life of Stephen. I say short spiritual life because he was probably saved sometime between Pentecost and, and now. I mean, he wasn't a believer all that long. He wasn't an apostle. He's not ever mentioned as a disciple. He's never hanging around that we know of. He was, he's a new believer. They're all new believers, by the way. I believe that the apostles themselves became believers when they, when they witnessed the resurrected Christ and all of a sudden started to understand things. Then the Holy Spirit came on them, and now all of a sudden they have the wisdom of the Spirit, and now they can preach and teach and share things. And I think it was based on that preaching and teaching that Stephen became a believer, and then he, he took his knowledge of Judaism and the Old Testament and what he had witnessed, and now he was teaching. So he was actually being discipled. He was learning from the apostles, and then he was passing on what he learned. And he was a disciple of the apostles. So what are the lessons to learn from Stephen's short spiritual life? He didn't, he didn't have that long of a ministry. Uh, first three kind of go together. They're on the first side of the page, so that works well. And, and they're really not great news. We're not going to get excited about these lessons. We just need to accept them. Number one, opposition from your faith or opposition to your faith can come out of nowhere. Can, it can literally come out of nowhere. Let me, let me backtrack and ask a little bit. Let me read you a few scriptures. You don't have to find them, just, just follow along. So Acts 2.41 says, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Acts 2.47 says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Acts 4.4 4 says, But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who grew, who believed grew to about 5,000. Of course, we have women and children on top of that. Acts 6.1 says, In those days the number of disciples was increasing. Okay? And Acts 6.7 so, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So everything was going great. The church was functioning. The church was working. They were a family. They were supporting one another. They prayed for one another. They supplied each other's needs. People were getting saved literally left and right. Every day they'd probably get together and they'd talk about who they witnessed to, who they shared Christ with, and who became a believer. People were getting saved daily, adding to the number. It was, I mean, just think of how perfect the church would be in, in your best description of the church. We're reaching our community. People are getting saved. People are joining in. We're being taught. We're, we're following God. We're learning. That's who they were. It was, it was going awesomely. And now all of a sudden... Stephen is doing what he was supposed to be doing. Remember, he was one of the guys earlier that was seen as full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He was put uh, in the group of seven to distribute the food. He's listed first, so he was probably the one in charge. So he's the cream of the crop. He's following the disciples' lead. He's not just serving food. He's also teaching. He's also doing signs and wonders. And he gets challenged by these other people who really have just had enough. We, we don't like what's going on. We want to protect Judaism. 
Someone needs to challenge these people. Maybe even Saul stood up and said, hey, you know what? I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I have the right pedigree. I have the right education. If anyone can put these people in their place, I can do it. And they went and they challenged Stephen. It absolutely came out of nowhere. And I'm going to try to put application in along the way. It's not in your notes, but it's pretty obvious. Opposition to your faith can come out of nowhere. You can just be going along, worshiping God, praising God, serving God, and then all of a sudden realize you're being attacked and you didn't even know it was coming. And, and this is very possible, and frankly, it's getting more likely in, 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 as we progress in, in history here. But it came absolutely out of nowhere. Stephen wasn't expecting it. They weren't expecting it. Matter of fact, if you were, if you were at keeping score, the church was winning against the Sanhedrin. Every time, every time they clashed, the Sanhedrin lost and the church won. The Sanhedrin and their followers shrunk and the church and their followers grew. So they, they are winning in every category. But all of a sudden, this new attack comes, can, can absolutely come out of nowhere. Number two, your spiritual enemies will lie in order to shut you up. This should not be a surprise, although I will admit it's always a surprise. I am always surprised when someone has lied about me, the church, or someone I know. It has happened before. It is happening now. It will happen again. I'm always surprised. I think it's because I belong to the father of truth, and liars are following the father of lies. They're following his example. And if they're an enemy of God, then they answer to the father of lies. Acts 5.3, remember, Satan filled Ananias' heart, so they lied to the Holy Spirit. There's a reminder that even the believers are susceptible to Satan's temptations. Ananias was a believer. He was part of the church. Satan filled Ananias' heart so that he lied. He told him to do it. He tempted him, whatever the case was. Even people who are our friends can be tempted to lie. We need to be aware of that. John 8, 44 says, When Satan lies, he speaks his native language. That's where he's called the father of lies. And let's not forget that they made up lies about Jesus, and now they're doing the same with Stephen. So spiritual enemies will lie. Why were these guys spiritual enemies? Because their, their history and their traditions were being challenged. Because they were losing the authority and power and prestige they once had. They weren't willing to make adjustments. They weren't willing to listen. So now they were enemies. These people who were following Jesus, they were, they were not someone we were wanting to deal with. We'd rather get rid of them. So your spiritual enemies will lie to shut you up. You just need to be aware. And number three, things can get really bad really fast when you serve God faithfully and righteously. I wrote this below that in my notes. As we build the family, we also gain enemies. There are jealous people, there are God-haters, and there are some that are in competition with us. Uh, you probably read in the bulletin, this is my, uh, my seventh anniversary, Teresa and I's seventh anniversary of coming to Heritage Bible Church. When we got here, 91 people stood in this sanctuary and said, Go, Dave! We like you! Lead us! 91 people. 91 to 0 was the vote. I don't want to count, because I don't really want to know how many of those 91 people never set foot in this church again after that day. I don't want to count how many people quit setting foot in this church in the two or three years after that. We went from 91, and we were hovering around 45, 45 to 50. And then we got back into the 50s. Well, that was, that was good news. And then we got into the 60s. That was pretty exciting. And we stretched into the 70s. And we touched 80. And then the last two years happened. And, and we're, we're reaching again. We're striving. We're not giving up. But you know what? In the course of time, um, there's people that got very angry with me because I stood up here and I said abortion is wrong. And people got very angry with me because I said you shouldn't vote for someone who is going to openly support abortion. Uh, people got angry with me because I said that um, gay marriage is wrong. All, all this other stuff, wrong. We go with scripture. 
We go with the Bible. We changed our bylaws to make it very clear. We changed our constitution to make it very clear that the Bible was the standard and we stuck with the standard no matter what anyone else said. People didn't like that. People haven't liked how we've handled things in the last couple of years. There are people that will not come here because of the way we handled things, whether, whether we could show it was biblical or not. As we build the family, we'll also build enemies. You should expect that there will be people who don't like you because you are a Christian. I was all of a sudden not worthy to coach a, a little league team because I was a Christian pastor. And it wasn't said to me, but it was sort of apparent. And then that happened. Th these things happen. Things get, can get really bad really fast when you serve God faithfully. Because the more you serve God, the more Satan wants to take you out of commission. He wants to stop you from serving God, and he will lie about you. He will have other people lie about you. He will attack you physically, mentally, spiritually. He'll attack you through others. He'll attack people you love. And, and the whole time he'll be whispering, what's God done for you now? How's this working out? I thought it was supposed to be all roses and, and dandelions and nice weather and, and potlucks and really cool stuff. What's the deal? Why are you suffering? And this is a chance for us to rise up and say, God, walk with me through this. Get me through this trial. Get me through this temptation. Get me through this hardship. And Satan will attack us. So things can get really bad really fast. So the first three lessons are that God never promised us a bed of roses without thorns. He never promised us an easy walk. He says, I'll make your walk better. I'll make the thorns more endurable. I'll give you peace and joy in the midst of the trial. I'll take you to the calm water. I'll put you in a green pasture. I'll set a table for you in the midst of your enemies. But you will still be in the midst of your enemies. The, the predators will still be on the outside looking in. And the rough water is still just a little ways away. I'll take care of you in the process. So yeah, as believers, there are... There are issues and there are actual people who will rise up against us. I think the best approach is just to say, well, go ahead. There's no reason for me to engage with you. Think what you're going to think. Say what you're going to say. The truth will come out. The truth will set, set us free. And when I get to heaven, I'll get a reward if I'm truly being following God. And so that's, I think that's the approach we take. Stephen didn't change his mind. The apostles didn't change his, their mind. They didn't take a different tactic. They didn't do different things. And I think we can learn from that. So number four, and you notice the next lesson, this is huge, absolutely huge. God gave Stephen exactly what he needed to accomplish his will. Now, we look at the bigger picture of Acts, and we can determine what God's will was. What was God doing through this whole process? This was God's way of saying, it's been great. We're doing awesome in Jerusalem. Remember that part about go ye into all the world and make disciples? It's time to get on with the rest of the world part. We've all stayed here. It's been wonderful. You've been taught. You've grown. Now you're ready to go. And, and the event of Stephen's martyrdom triggered a series of other events that pushed the Christians out into the world. And it started that process. And, and I think that was the big picture will of God. He says, now it's time to go. And I'm going to create some events that are going to send you out. Because frankly, you're going to stay here without it. Because it's, it's really nice. You're going to stay here. And he says, I want you to go. So he sent them out. All right. God gave Stephen exactly what he needed to accomplish his will. What did he give him? A, he gave him wisdom and biblical insight when he was a teacher and an apologist. We see that in verse 10. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit of God gave him when he spoke. They, they confronted him as a teacher and they couldn't break him. He gave him the wisdom and biblical insight. Remember, he's a fairly new believer. Okay, B, the Holy Spirit gave him a vision when he needed hope and calmness. He looked into heaven and he saw the Father and the Son standing next to him. That's quite a vision. It, it allowed him to then proceed through his execution by stoning and his offer of forgiveness. It gave him a vision that strengthened his soul. 
And then C, the Holy Spirit gave him a Christ-like attitude when he needed to forgive, when he needed to voice his forgiveness. So he got insight from the Holy Spirit, he got a vision from the Holy Spirit, and he received a Christ-like attitude from the Holy Spirit. And I think the key here is that Stephen chose to follow God. He didn't back away when challenged. He didn't change his teaching. Matter of fact, he kind of amped it up a little bit. So the application is, when you choose to follow God wholeheartedly, God will also give you exactly what you need to accomplish his will. Now, if you're not going to follow him, he's not going to provide for you. Oftentimes, God says, here's step one, take step one, then I'll provide for step two. You take step two, he provides for step three. That's usually how it works. He wants you to move forward one step at a time. How might he provide for you? Well, A, finances to navigate through the time and space required. Biblical insights to share God's ideas and perspectives when necessary. Christ-like attitude to show love, patience, and forgiveness for those you're working with, those you're trying to reach. Stephen chose to follow God, and God gave him exactly what he needed. When we choose to follow God, he'll give us exactly what we need to accomplish whatever he's asking us to do in our family, at our job, at our hobbies, in our neighborhood, wherever we might be, in our church. Number five, the fifth lesson. Stephen's teaching and debate, his physical appearance, and, and that's when his face shone like an angel, the sermon, which we didn't read, the vision of heaven we just talked about, And his ability to forgive when he said, forgive these people, they don't know what they're doing, were all products of the Holy Spirit. They were all products of the Holy Spirit. You might say they were gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let me read you Acts 6.5. It says, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Acts 6.8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. Okay? And Acts 7.55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen had the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the repeated phrase. That's the key phrase. The Holy Spirit provided Stephen these, these gifts. What's our application? Well, I've already said that God will provide what you need. So the application is to ask. To ask. Father, if you want me to do this, provide what I need. Here's some things you can ask for. Ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten and lead you as you speak of him and for him. Ask the the Holy Spirit to let people see the presence of God in your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak through you when you answer questions. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a vision uh, of what your eternal future holds. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the ability to forgive those who harm you. Each of these is seen in Stephen's story. We could make a much longer list of things you can ask the Holy Spirit for. Um, I, I just, you know, I just reminded myself, maybe God reminded me of something that happened when I was a kid. D was ask the Holy Spirit to give you a vision of what your eternal future looks like. I remember being a kid hearing about the rapture. And the rapture kind of freaked me out a little bit. What's it going to be like? What if for some reason I don't get taken? All the questions that a 9, 10, 11-year-old kid are going to ask when they hear about this new concept where all the believers are going to be taken. And I think I, I was a, a little freaked out about that. Probably stayed up a little bit, not sleeping, wondering what was going on. And I had a dream. Now, <laughs> when someone tells me I had a dream, I go, whoa, back the trail up. But I just had a, an innocent childhood dream that the rapture took place. And I don't know if my dream lasted three seconds or longer, but all I remember from the dream is that I was floating up and I looked around and there were other people floating up. We didn't arrive anywhere. We didn't leave anywhere. We were just floating up. And in my 9, 10, 11-year-old mind, I was okay with the whole thing now. It didn't bother me anymore. Maybe God provided me that dream. I'm not even going to call it a vision. But he provided Stephen a vision. He looked up into heaven, saw the Father and and Jesus standing next to him. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and they start asking you questions? 
and you answer the questions and you get done and you go, how did I know that? Man, I, I didn't know that I was capable of having that conversation. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're not. That's the Holy Spirit. Have you ever led someone to Christ and at the end you go, man, that was so much easier than I thought it would. I remembered the Romans road. I remembered the, the, the elements of prayer. I was so scared before, but it was so easy. Well, that was the Holy Spirit. You have a conversation where you, you talk to someone about Scripture. That's the Holy Spirit active. And if you're going to choose to follow God wholeheartedly, you can expect the Holy Spirit to do the same for you as he did for Stephen. He's going to provide what you need to be successful. Number six, sometimes we cannot understand what God is doing sovereignly. I mean big picture. Sometimes we absolutely cannot understand what God is doing big picture. As we suffer through persecution, trial, test, and other painful stuff in our own little world. And I don't mean little world in a belittling way. I just want us to realize that the amount of world we function in is tiny, tiny, tiny. And the world that God functions in is huge, huge, huge. And he is orchestrating all the events to work together to accomplish his will. So what happened because of Stephen being martyred? Well, A, Saul broke loose on the scene and became an enemy of Jesus. Dave, that doesn't sound like good news. No, it did not. And when he was running around arresting people and putting them on trial and having them executed, a whole lot of people were thinking this is not good news. This Saul dude, if you see him, run the other way, because if he catches you, it never ends well. It was, it was not good news. But Jesus got a hold of him on the road, knocked him off his horse, had a short conversation with him, completely turned his life around, and he became the Apostle Paul. Well, he had to become the evil Saul so that he could become the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had clout because he had been evil Saul. And God needed to take him through that process, and this was him kind of graduating into that role. It went so well killing Stephen. A lot of people thought it was great. This group got boosted a little bit. Saul got boosted up. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he's finally getting the recognition he deserves in the Sanhedrin and among the other Pharisees. And he said, you know what, people? We need to put a stop to this, and I'm just the man to do it. Give me some authority. Give me some papers, and I'll go round those Christians up. And then we'll take care of them one at a time. And the rest of them went, yeah, you do that. And they sent him off. Saul broke loose. And the process, eventually, he became Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament and started a whole bunch of churches and taught a lot of doctrine and became one of our faith fathers. Uh, B, what happened, because Stephen was martyred, all the foreign converts headed back home Gospel in hand, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. All these people that were hanging around, they got out of there. You know, it's been good so far, now it's time to go home. And they took the gospel back home with them. They continued to share the gospel. I imagine some churches got started. Paul started some churches later. But Paul might have showed up in the town and found a bunch of believers. That happened on occasion. Churches were started. People were saved. The process of going into all the world and preaching the gospel, get, making disciples, began because this event with Stephen took place. C, other preachers were inspired to carry Stephen's torch wherever they went. We see that later in chapter 8, um, verse 5 through 9. We read about Philip. Philip went to Samaria, and he preached, he preached boldly, okay? So we have Philip, one of the other seven men who was put in charge of the food program. He was one of the ones that left. He went to Samaria, and he preached. And the D.R. Bibles, the gospel reaching our lands, are all the result of Stephen's life and martyrdom. It kicked off the disbursement. We actually can, can trace... The gospel coming to America back to Stephen's martyrdom because it got the ball rolling. It got things started. 
So we look at Stephen as a hero. You know, if we didn't know all this stuff, we might have thought, you know, the guy should have just, like, gone home for the day, not argued so much. He could have preached a little bit more later. He didn't have to infuriate these people. They were literally gnashing their teeth at him. They were so angry. You've got to be pretty angry to gnash your teeth at somebody. He could have backed off, but no, he didn't. We could criticize him for that, but no, we won't. Because he did exactly what the Holy Spirit was telling him to do because God had a bigger plan, and we owe pretty much the New Testament, pretty much the gospel going around the world to this event. It got the ball rolling. So your last application. When you are being attacked for being a Christian, not if, when. Not maybe you might be, but I'm sure you will be. You may not be attacked like Stephen was attacked, but there's various levels of attack. When it comes, when you're overlooked, when you're pushed aside, when you're ignored, when you're laughed at, maybe when you're physically attacked, maybe when other things happen, when you're financially burdened, when you're attacked for being a Christian, number one, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you through it for God's glory and God's will. I don't think we're really supposed to say, you know, God, I don't, I don't want to endure anything. I don't want people not liking me. I don't want people saying bad things about me. I, I, I don't even want to, and I don't even want to, you know, engage. So just take it away. I think we're supposed to say, God, you know what's happening. You see it coming ahead of time. Would you guide me and walk with me and be my partner in this? And would you get me to the other side for your honor and your glory? And I'll go wherever you take me. and I'll do whatever you ask me to do. You ask the Holy Spirit to lead you because the Holy Spirit can and will provide exactly what you need to be successful. Number two, trust God to never put you in a position where you can't succeed. He says, I'll never allow you to be tested. I'll never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. And with every test and with every temptation, I will provide a way to escape. I'll provide a way to stand up under it so that you can be successful in it, so that you can have victory over it. Trust God to never give you something you can't handle. So if it's coming, stand up straight and say, with God, I can handle this. With God, I will get through this. With God, we will be successful. With God, I will be used for his purposes. Because I trust God that he'll never put me in a position where I will fail because he is with me. He will provide for me. He will protect me. Even if I'm martyred like Stephen, He'll give me a vision that will hold me through to the end. I don't think Stephen on his own could take a stoning and ask for forgiveness for the people that were doing it. I think it was the vision of God and the vision of Jesus that set him up for the Holy Spirit to empower him so that he could endure whatever pain he had to so that he could accomplish God's will. And then number three, when you are being attacked for being a Christian, by faith... Endure till the end, knowing this is really part of God's master plan. Remember the God whose space is really, really big? Part of God's master plan. By faith, endure to the end, knowing it's his plan. That's, that's how you're going to make it. That's how you're going to get through. That's how you're going to be successful. So when you are attacked, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. Trust God that he's in control and endure to the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your, your word. Thank you for Stephen, who in his young faith learned and grew and applied and became a worker of signs and wonders and a preacher of Jesus Christ. And through the Holy Spirit was able to stand up and, 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 and win the challenge when challenged by this group from the synagogue. Thank you that he did not back down and he preached your word boldly, even though it cost him his life. Thank you for his example and his, his inspiration. Thank you that you provided for him what he needed to be successful. And in my mind, I even, I even wonder if you took away the pain during the stoning because he was looking at you, because the Holy Spirit was so active. I don't know that. But we know it's possible. Father, thank you that, that even though we don't like trouble and we don't like hardship and we certainly don't like being picked on and, and being persecuted, 
Thank you that you also went through this before us and you will go through it right now with us when necessary and that you will have your will accomplished and we will be by your side receiving blessing from you in the process. Help us to be strong. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.